God speaks to us. Come to me, all of you who labor and are heavy laden. I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. For I am meek and lowly of heart, and you shall find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. Welcome to Moravian Worship this week. We are grateful for those of you who are tuning in to watch. Just a, uh, a few announcements, a reminder that you can certainly find this service uh, by going to the church website or the church has its own YouTube channel and encourage you to go there because we are now able to add some other pieces of content, special music. Um, also this week you will be able to see a video of Dennis uh, Svat, our, uh, one of our other musicians, uh, playing the piano. So I encourage you to, to take time to listen to that and enjoy that. Uh, a reminder to please check out the, my Friday email update. Um, that serves really as the bulletin for the church at this time, and I would, there you will find announcements and upcoming um, things that you need to know about. I would like to take a few moments, though, this morning before we begin worship um, to share with you a, a report that came in yesterday from our provincial elders president, the Reverend Dr. Betsy Miller. She writes, as the days of COVID-19 continue, we are finding out about how these deaths have impacted our Moravian church. Reverend Katie Vanderlinden, who serves our Ebenezer Moravian Church down in Watertown, she lost her grandfather, Gerald Miller, on April 18th. He lived in Pennsylvania. Reverend Matt Gillard, who serves in Canada, lost his grandmother on April 21st. She lived in Long Island. Reverend Don Volpe, who serves up at our Ephraim Moravian Church, Dawn found out yesterday that her sister-in-law, Lois Gibson, passed away in New York City. Dawn also reports that two members of her brother's family have also died, That's, and that five others are also ill at this time. Reverend Girl, Earl Goldburn, who's the pastor of Grace Moravian Church in Queens, has reported in that six members of his congregation have passed away because of COVID-19. Betsy writes, I am aware that Parishioners and other Moravian congregations have also passed away, but at this time I can't give you any more specific numbers or congregations. I share this with all of you to remind you, to remind you of why we are working very hard at doing what we are doing, and also that you might be praying for those in the greater Mor Moravia Church who are uh, carrying the burden of loss and grief at this time.
Our scripture reading this morning is from the Gospel of Luke. Uh, it is the story that's commonly called On the Road to Emmaus, and it immediately follows, in Luke's account, it immediately follows the discovery of the, of the empty tomb and, uh, and the reaction of the 11 who had been holed up in the upper room. Now that same day, two of them were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. They were talking with each other about everything that had happened. As they talked and discussed these things with each other, Jesus himself came up and walked along with them, but they were kept from recognizing him. He asked them, what are you discussing together as you walk along? They stood still, their faces downcast. One of them, named Cleopas, asked him, Are you only a visitor to Jerusalem and do not know the things that have happened there in these days? What things? he asked. About Jesus of Nazareth, they replied. He was a prophet, powerful in word and deed before God and all the people. The chief priests and our rulers handed him over to be sentenced to death, and they crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one who was going to redeem Israel. And what is more, it is the third day since all this took place. In addition, some of our women amazed us. They went to the tomb early this morning, but didn't find his body. They came and told us that they had a vision of angels who said he was alive. Then some of our companions went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, but him they did not see. He said to them, how foolish you are and how slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Did not the Christ have to suffer these things and then enter his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained to them that what it was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. As they approached the village to which they were going, Jesus acted as if he was going further. But they urged him strongly, stay with us, for it is nearly evening. The day is almost over. So he went in to stay with them. When he was at the table with them, he took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and began to give it to them. Then their eyes were opened, and they recognized him, and he disappeared from their sight. They asked each other, were not our hearts burning within us while he talked with us on the road and opened the scriptures to us? They got up and returned at once to Jerusalem. There they found the eleven and those with them assembled together and saying, it is true. The Lord has risen and has appeared to Simon. Then the two told what had happened on the way and how Jesus was recognized by them when he broke the bread. This story of the two disciples meeting Jesus on the road to Emmaus and not recognizing him until later when he broke bread with them is, is rich with things to ponder and to study and to preach about. We are told that the disciples are puzzled over the events of Easter. Do we puzzle over the events of Easter? And should we? And if we don't puzzle over these events, then what are the things that we are confused about? Jesus accuses the two travelers of being slow to believe. Are we sometimes slow to believe? What exactly is it that we do believe about God and about people and about Jesus? Cleopas and his friend only recognized Jesus when he broke bread for them. Do you only recognize Jesus when he feeds you? How is it that Jesus feeds you? The disciples' heart, we are told, hearts were warmed as Jesus reminded them of the prophecies in Scripture. So are our hearts warmed when we read or hear the word of the Lord? I could go on and on and pick plenty of topics from this passage, I think, including the main theme, which might very well be seen as a description of how people who have never seen Jesus can come to know him. The story really doesn't tell us why these two disciples are going to Emmaus. 
It's an insignificant little town somewhere near Jerusalem. They may have been going to visit someone they knew. They may have been going home. Or they may have been running away from the events of the last week in Jerusalem when Jesus was arrested and tried and crucified and buried. They had heard from the women who went to the tomb that it was empty. And it was told that there were those who had seen and heard angels who said Jesus was risen from the dead. These two, like all the disciples, were confused. The city was in an uproar. They were scared. And so they ran away, going to a place they thought would be safer. One of our favorite authors, Frederick Buechner, who, he adopts this interpretation of fear and flight. Emmaus, he says, is a place we go in order to escape. A bar, a movie, wherever it is we throw up our hands and say, let the whole damn thing go hang. It makes no difference anyway. Emmaus may be buying a new suit or a new car or buying a second-rate novel or even writing one. Emmaus may be going to church on Sunday. Emmaus is whatever we do or wherever we go to make ourselves forget that the world holds nothing sacred, that even the wisest and bravest and loveliest decay and die, that even the noblest ideas that people have had, ideas about love and freedom and justice, have always in time been twisted out of shape by selfish people for selfish ends. Kind of a dark paragraph from an author and theologian who usually brings light to the subject. But it does seem right now that our world is twisted out of shape. And surely it is true that the coronavirus holds nothing to be sacred. Ironically, even many of the places to which we normally flee in fear have been taken away from us. And people, because they have no place to flee, are beginning to get angry and edgy and sometimes even irrational. Surely our best natures, the very best things about us, our love, freedom, justice, and willingness to sacrifice to help others, these things have been extremely evident as we battle this virus. But it is also true that as we practice social distancing and staying safe at home, as our workplaces shut down and our places of escape are denied to us, our fear and our anger can take over. This place of fear and anger is exactly where these disciples found themselves as they ran away to Emmaus. And Jesus found them there. He walked along the road, spoke with them, and warmed their hearts. Jesus will find us as well. And he will warm our hearts right now when we badly need some warming. Just like the disciples, we may not recognize him at first. When they stopped, Jesus continued to walk on, just a stranger to them until they invited him in to eat. And it was when he broke bread with them that they finally recognized him. Invite Jesus into your table. He is around. He has been traveling with you all along. You may see him in your spouse, in your children, in a relative, a friend, a neighbor, or perhaps even a stranger. Remember, there are many who have entertained angels and not known it. Jesus walks with all people, but not all people invite him in. We can find him and we can recognize him in our simplest acts of fellowship, the breaking of bread and the giving of thanks. Jesus, after the disciples had recognized him, moved on right away and he disappeared from their presence. But even so, they were overjoyed and they hurried to go share their experience just like them, your moments of transcendent enlightenment, of incredible closeness to God, those mountaintop experiences, as we call them, may be fleeting. But remember that the spirit of Christ will remain in you forever. I've had a few of those precious moments in my life when Christ revealed himself to me in a, 
unusually clear way. Over the years, I have shared many of those experiences with you. And those are moments that have changed my life forever, just as these disciples on the road to Emmaus were changed, and just as you have been and will be. Through the study of Scripture, the Word of God, our hearts are strangely warmed. We encounter the risen Lord in our fellowship. Christ is with us, even in our deepest times of stress and fear. These are things that we know. This is our faith. So how could we not share this good news? The road to Emmaus is not just a place we travel in fear on our way to hide. It is also a place where we encounter Jesus. In many ways, the story of Emmaus and the road to Emmaus is the story of our entire lives. It is a story of Christian journey that ends in love and joy and eternal life. And we are called to invite others to make this journey with us. In these times of staying at home, be sure to take time to invite Jesus into your family fellowship. And when we, the church, gather together again, whenever that may be, we will share our joy and our faith with community fellowship as well. I will look forward in faith to that day when we can break bread together. Let us bow in prayer. Almighty, loving, and gracious God, we acknowledge that this fellowship, this way of life that we call church, belongs to you. It is you who have created the Christian church, the way of Christ. We confess that often we forget that, and we let our own desires and disagreements get in the way of serving and of worshiping and of doing your will. Help us to see things more clearly and to realize that it is not we who have all the answers, but you. Keep us together as a community of believers, even as we are separated during this difficult time. We thank you for the blessing of life with you as we work together toward the fulfillment of your kingdom. You have given us a wonderful world to live in, and we ask your help in seeing the need to care for it and not just use it up. Our hope and our joy are placed in our Savior, Jesus Christ. We thank you for this precious gift that is a reflection of your love. We pray for all those threatened by the coronavirus today. We ask your protection for those you have so wondrously made. We seek healing for the sick and give thanks for the caregivers. We ask your blessing on those who risk so much to care for others. We thank you for friends and family and ask that you bless them and protect them. We ask your blessing on our young people who are missing out on so much that they hold dear. School activities, graduation ceremonies, sports, church activities, camps. We pray for peace and order in our world that all may see a way to live together in harmony. Show us a way to help those who are powerless, who are destitute and are suffering. We take a moment now to come to you in silent prayer with those joys and concerns that are close to our hearts. Father, hear our prayers. Keep us from temptation and deliver us from evil. Amen. May the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of the Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen.